We've got uh, A, what the consequences of putting Brett Kavanaugh or any other right winger on the court would mean, which is why there are some of us, and Republicans are accusing Democrats of this already. This Mitch McConnell is very clear that he thinks this is the Democratic strategy, and it frankly, I think, should be, is that if the Democrats win the Senate in November, they will refuse to seat anybody else, to put anybody else in the Supreme Court until Donald Trump's, until the investigations into the legitimacy of Donald Trump's presidency have concluded. It's a much better rationalization than the one that Mitch McConnell had, which is, hey, you know, he's just a black guy. He's, he's our black president. We can ignore what he wants for a year. I mean, I, obviously, that's not what he said. What he said was, well, gee, there's an election coming. Well, there's an election coming in two years. I mean, it was, it was uh, such a BS thing. But uh, Alex Henderson over on Alternet uh, published a piece. Here are the five, five of Clarence Thomas's worst decisions. These are all things that will probably be overturned when you've got five uh, Federalist Society members on the court. Lawrence v. Thomas in 2003, which uh, overturned Texas's sodomy laws and, and, and basically ended the criminalization of being gay. Uh, Obergefell versus Hodges. This is the a five to four decision that, in effect, legalized same-sex marriage in all 50 states. King v. Burwell upheld the constitutionality of Obamacare, with the exception of the Medicaid part, which really kind of gutted it, but still. And Whole Women's Health versus Hellerstead, uh, which said that the state of Texas could not restrict abortion services if it, if it uh, put an undue burden, the, the court's phrase, on women. So, you know, some serious stuff. Marty in New Hampton, Pennsylvania. Hey, Marty, what's on your mind today? Hello. Hey, Marty, you're on the air. Hi, how you doing? Uh, I love the show. I just have a question about uh, the Supreme Court pick and uh, your take that what might happen in the future should affect the vote on the man to begin with. Okay. Uh, if you rationale that, what he might vote or what decisions may be overturned, then you're kind of disrespecting the court, the entire idea of the court of being neutral. The court's not you're neutral. You, excuse me? The court is not neutral. In the last, yes, 80, in the last 80 cases, you know, high-profile cases, cases where there was a Republican financial interest as a participant, right? You know, a, a businesses in pollution or whatever it may be. In the last 80 cases... 92% of them were decided on behalf of the Republican financial interest, as opposed to the workers, the right. people, so, so the saying, children. So you're actually stating that the Supreme Court no longer bases their decisions on the Constitution. That's absolutely what I'm saying. Okay, I happen to disagree with that. Well, I would, uh, I would direct you to Heller, I, for example. If I, may, if I may offer a, um, a hypothetical. Sure. Uh, if, say uh, Kamala Harris wins the 2020 election. And the Senate is uh, over, is taken by the Democrats, but the House is still held by Republicans. And at that time, Judge Clarence Thomas retires. Now, does that mean that, in, based on what your principle is, is that that seat that seat should go uh, to a conservative because it was of a conservative? What I'm saying and is I, two things, Marty. The first is that what we call conservatives are not conservatives; they're right-wing reactionary radicals. Okay, and you know and that? there has, to the best of my knowledge, never been a left-wing reactionary radical on the Supreme Court. Never. The, the people that the, the, the people on the court that have been nominated by Democratic presidents have have typically been uh, people in the middle, essentially. And the people that are being appointed now via the Federalist Society are hardcore right wing reactionaries whose only interest is the is the interests of the very, very wealthy and the very, very powerful in the society. And the rationale well, for that is this right wing belief that, as Thomas Hobbes said, in man's natural state, life is short, nasty, and brutish. You know, without the intervening force of church or state, is what Thomas Hobbes said in Leviathan. And this is the core of the, of the conservative worldview, that you need to have an authoritarian state. So uh, what I'm saying is that the Supreme Court has been so heavily politicized now. And, uh, you know, I would say, frankly, since, since, the, uh, since the 1870s, I mean, you know, uh, Abraham Lincoln took the size of the court up to 10 
so that he could start winning decisions. Andrew Johnson, who followed him when uh, General Sherman gave 50,000 African-Americans 40 acres and a mule, Andrew Johnson, then president of the United States, retracted that. A case went to the Supreme Court around it, and Johnson reduced the size of the Supreme Court to seven. Uh, you know, the, we have been playing games with the Supreme Court literally since the 1860s. Don't forget, Rose, don't and, forget Franklin Roosevelt, and, uh, who also tried to go to 12. He tried to pack the court. Yeah, absolutely. It would have been 13, actually. But, but here's the thing. I'm suggesting that, be, that, that, that because of Marbury versus Madison, 1803, because the court has taken onto itself the power to strike down laws passed by Congress and signed by the president, and even come up with brand new doctrines, you know, things that didn't exist at law at all. For example, the concept of the three different trimesters, each having a different legal consequence, which was articulated in Roe, or the concept that corporations are people, which was, you know, first stated in the head note in Santa Clara County back in 1886 and, and now has become, you know, amplified by Citizens United. Um, and I could, you know, I could go on. I, if, Heller, uh, you know, Scalia finding an individual right to own guns in the Constitution, he had to go back to, in order to find that, he had to go to an anti-federalist pamphlet that was published in an obscure Pennsylvania newspaper in the 1790s. An anti-federalist, a guy, a guy who was opposed to the Constitution itself. That was the basis that Scalia used for his so-called original intent. The, these are all partisan decisions. And for this reason, I think that, number one, the court, the size of the court should be expanded. Uh, you know, the, the, the Supreme Court of India, I think, has 35 people on it. The Supreme Court, and the Supreme Courts of many uh, European countries have as many as 20 people on them. I think the size of the court should be expanded, number one. And number two, I think Supreme Court justices should be term limited to 18 years. And that way you're going to, and, and every, and you, and you span, you, you stretch it out in, as you, as you roll this in over an 18 year period so that every president will have a couple of nominations coming up as the natural consequence of this. And I think that that would clean up this, this thing.